Okay, we just finished talking about these eight questions to evaluate a regression from Chapter 2 in Studentman's book. And again, these eight questions are things that you need to ask yourself when you're doing a regression project or when you're looking at someone else's work trying to evaluate it. You also want to ask yourself when you read through a report, does the author provide you enough information uh, so that you can evaluate these questions? If they don't tell you where the data came from and, and therefore you can't even evaluate if the data set is reasonably large and accurate, then that's a big strike against the paper also or the study. So you, you have to provide information to people. Don't force them to guess whether these things are true or not. You are supposed to make your own case that these questions are answered and people should be satisfied. So. Also in Chapter 3, Studentman gives us this list of six steps. Now once again, this is a, a place where if you ask a thousand people, what are the steps? You'll get different steps and different numbers of steps. But this is a very good starting place for how to start thinking about doing econometrics. And so the, really the first step is you, you decide that you want to explain something and you determine that you want to explain cancer rates or incomes or the price of cars or crime rates and after you determine that the, f the first step is to see what other people have done and we call that reviewing the literature. Reviewing the literature means you go out and you read other people's studies. It may also involve talking to people, asking them questions, you just try to learn as much about the topic as you possibly can and hopefully also check out formal studies where people have collected data and analyzed it. So review the literature. You want to stand on the shoulders of giants. This means you want to learn from previous studies and hopefully build on that and add something to it. So reviewing the literature is not only to learn it's also to make sure that you don't just simply repeat what someone else has done in the past. If you're taking the same data and doing the same thing to it, it's a waste of time for all intents and purposes. Unless you're just doing it to practice so that you can learn how to do something and see if you can replicate what someone has already done. But it's also to make sure that you understand what relationships there are etc. Once you review the literature and you read these other studies and you make careful notes, then it's time for you to develop your theoretical model. Now what do we mean by theoretical model? It depends on what field you're in. If you're an economist, this might involve setting up a model of supply and demand, or a model explaining gross domestic product, or a model of returns to education using math or using logic. In epidemiology it might be a model of disease transmission or a model of a disease process. In criminology it might be a model of the factors that increase or decrease crime. So whatever this model is, it may be formal in mathematical terms or it may just mean sitting down carefully and logically thinking through what are the causes, the effects, and what are the factors that you should include in order to explain something. Now second comes model specification. This is moving towards, okay, theoretically I know there are some factors that explain crime. Now you're getting more into the nitty-gritty. What are the actual variables that you're going to be able to collect data on in order to explain this relationship. So selecting the independent variables, you're getting more specific about exactly what kind of data will you be able to get. So you might, in your theoretical model, say that, well, income and wealth will affect the disease process. When you select an independent variable, you have to be specific. What do you mean by income? What do you mean by wealth and, and where do you think you're going to, to get this data? Is it going to be in dollars per month? You know, exactly how is it going to work? And rather than saying, well, the theoretical model says 
we think there's a relationship between income and the disease process, you need to specify a functional form. You need to choose. Well, should it be linear or nonlinear? And at this point, you might not know. It's valid to say, I really have no idea. And so in that case, you just want to start with a linear functional form and then check to make sure if that fits the data. And we'll talk about how to do that later in the course. Uh, third, you want to combine what you thought about carefully in your theory and what variables you're going to collect data on. And you want to carefully discuss what do you think the signs of these relationships will be. Do you think the sign will be positive? If income increases, people, people are more likely to get this disease? Or do you think that the sign is negative? If income goes up, people will be less likely to get this disease, for example. And you want to tell people what you think the sign will be and why. You need to justify it. Now again, sometimes you won't know. Sometimes you will say, well, you know, with heart disease, sometimes we see as income goes up, heart disease goes down because uh, people have more time or resources to get healthier. But then on the other hand, as income goes up, people can eat more. And as people eat more, maybe they'll have more heart disease. And so I don't know what the slope of this relationship will be. Reason it out and explain it to people that it could be either one. Uh, fourth, actually collect the data, inspect it, look at it, graph it, uh, calculate descriptive statistics, look and see if anything looks strange or out of place. So inspect the data, clean it, make sure all the numbers are right because if, if there's a number in there that's wrong, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, one common example of this is sometimes when you download data from various sources, if they don't know the value of, of a number in a data set, they'll replace a blank with the number 9 or 999 or 999999 or negative 99999. You, you don't want to leave those garbage numbers in there marking blanks. You want to convert them into blanks so that you understand what's going on. So it's very important that you understand what the data looks like and don't blindly jump into analyzing it right away. You also need to document where did the data come from, what are the units, uh, and what years did it come from. Fifth, this is where you actually get to do a regression and look at the output. So estimate it. Not only estimate what the slope and the y-intercepts are, you also need to evaluate what do the slopes mean, and you need to make sure that there aren't any problems with your regression. And again, we'll get more into what those problems could be later on. And sixth, document the results. Write it up, make sure it's clear enough for other people to follow what you've done. Now, I like to use this out, outline of six items to also tell you how to write a paper in a paper using econometrics or a project or a study, you want to have these six items roughly in this order. And make sure that nothing's missing from these six items when you write up a paper. And in the next part, we're going to look at a real paper and, and we're going to point out these, these six sections. But I want to add another section first, zero section. The first section of your paper should be an introduction. So if you think about what a paper looks like. You have an introduction where you tell what you're doing and why briefly. Get people interested in, in the topic. Tell them really what, what's, your, what's the most interesting part of this study to you. Then you talk about reviewing the literature and developing the theoretical model and what independent variables you'll have in the functional form. Then talk about what signs you expect to see and why. Then you talk about the data, where it came from, and give some descriptive statistics. Estimate the equation, evaluate it, discuss any problems, and also you want to discuss what the slopes and the y-intercepts mean. Um, not for all your variables maybe, but at least the most important ones to you. And this uh, document the results section Let's just call that the, uh, you know, summary and conclusions.
right, in a paper. Now, I'm not saying that every paper needs to have seven sections in it. Sometimes people will combine various sections. Sometimes people will split these sections into two. But as you read through a paper, you ought to be able to put your finger on the various important parts that document these steps that someone has gone through. Now in the next section, we're going to look at a, at a real paper, a real study, and discuss the importance and spot these different sections.